Hello and welcome to this channel. Anticoagulation in atrial fibrillation is a very important topic and deserves some details. So instead of including this topic in video on atrial fibrillation itself, which would have made that an overwhelmingly long video, I have made this video separately on this topic. To watch video on atrial fibrillation, click on the link shown in the top right corner of your screen or link in the description below. Now coming on to the main topic that is anticoagulation in atrial fibrillation. Loss of atrial contraction and left atrial dilatation causes stresses of blood in the left atrium and may lead to thrombus formation in the left atrial appendage. This predisposes patients to stroke and other forms of systemic embolism. Therefore, patients with atrial fibrillation needs consideration for anticoagulation. You may encounter three situations for decision about anticoagulation in AF. One is, if cardioversion is contemplated, anticoagulation should be given for at least three weeks before and three months after successful cardioversion. There are two exceptions here in this situation. One, those patients who require emergency cardioversion and second, those with new onset atrial fibrillation of less than 48 hours duration. Number two situation is, if there is underlying rheumatic mitral valve disease or in the presence of a mechanical heart valve, these patients should always be anticoagulated because the risk of thromboembolism in these patients is very high. Third situation include all other cases of chronic AF, whether paroxysmal, persistent or permanent. It shall be noted that in patients with intermittent AF, stroke risk is similar to that in patients with persistent AF when adjusted for CHADVAS score. The risk of embolism is only weakly related to the frequency and duration of atrial fibrillation episodes. So stroke prevention guidelines do not distinguish between those with paroxysmal, persistent and permanent atrial fibrillation. Here the need for anticoagulation should be assessed by using the CHAD-VAS score to assess embolic stroke risk, where C is congestive heart failure, H is hypertension, A age more than 75 years, D for diabetes, S for past history of stroke or TIA, B for vascular disease, whether coronary, aortic or peripheral vascular disease. Second A is again for age, but here less than 75 and more than 65 years. And last is sex category or gender. Female gender gets one point and for males it will be zero. Each factor scores one except age more than 75 years and stroke or TIA history, which gets a score of two. Minimum score is 0 while maximum score is 9. Consider anticoagulation if the score in males is 1 or more and in females it is 2 or more. If scoring result is in favor of anticoagulating the patient, balance the benefits of anticoagulation against the risk of bleeding. And this is assessed with another scoring system known as has blood score, where H is for uncontrolled hypertension, A for abnormal liver function tests or renal function tests. S for stroke or TIA, B for history or predisposition to major bleeding, L for labile INR in patients on warfarin, E for elderly patients more than 65 years of age, and D for drugs that can predispose to bleeding, for example NSAIDs, antiplatelets, and toxins like alcohol abuse. Abnormal liver and abnormal renal functions get one score individually and similarly in D, drugs will get one point and toxin like alcohol abuse will get separate one point if present. Patients with a has blood score of three or more points may require more careful monitoring if anticoagulated. You may use online calculators to check and calculate both these scores. When long-term anticoagulation is considered, either warfarin or one of the direct-acting oral anticoagulants can be used. If warfarin is used, target INR is 2 to 3. Warfarin reduces the risk of stroke by about two-thirds at the cost of an annual risk of bleeding of 1 to 1.5%. If bleeding occurs in patients treated with warfarin, anticoagulation can be reversed by administering vitamin K or clotting factors. The direct acting oral anticoagulant agents fall into two classes direct thrombin inhibitors, for example, dabigatran, and oral direct factor 10A inhibitors, for example, rivaroxaban, apixaban, and adoxaban. Direct acting oral anticoagulants specifically block a single step in the coagulation cascade in contrast to warfarin, which blocks several vitamin K dependent factors, that is, 2, 7, 9, and 10. Unlike warfarin, the direct oral anticoagulants have a rapid onset of action 
shorter half-life, fewer food and drug interactions, and these do not require INR testing. Trial data have shown them to be equally effective and safer as compared to warfarin. However, these agents require dose reduction or avoidance in patients with renal impairment, elderly patients, or those with low body weight. Agents that reverse the effects of direct oral anticoagulants have been developed. These include darucizumab, which binds to dabigatran and allows acute bleeding complications to be managed more effectively. If bleeding occurs with oral 10A inhibitors, it is reversible with indexanet. Some words about aspirin, which was previously a choice in patients with chad score of 1. Some authorities now believe that aspirin has little or no role in embolic prevention and rather it is associated with significant bleeding risk. I hope you liked this video and learned something. If so, please share with your colleagues and subscribe to this channel.